everybody's time this afternoon. Perfect. So hi, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon. Um, and welcome to our first preservation conversation of 2023. It's hard to believe we're already, we're already into the new year. Um, on behalf of Preservation Massachusetts, my name is Joe Ritter. I'm the Program and Advocacy Manager here. Um, and today we are joined by two wonderful guest speakers who will be walking us through Boston's newest public history um, and tourism opportunity, the Innovation Trail. So I'm joined this afternoon by Scott Kirsner who is the co-founder of the Boston Innovation Trail. Um, Scott, welcome. And I'm also joined, or we're also joined by Maggie O'Toole, who is the Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Lab Central in Cambridge. So Scott, Maggie, welcome to you both. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, for those of you who are new to our digital program, Preservation Conversations is a program we started here in 2020 as a way to connect with our statewide audience when our office was closed during the pandemic. And we've kept it up as a way to share um, thoughts, ideas, um, and resources with our statewide audience related to history, advocacy, and preservation. Um, and we'll continue to do that. And we've, we've got a lot of really good programs um, lined up for this next year. Um, so as a reminder, this conversation is being recorded and will be available after our conversation day on our website and on our YouTube channel. Um, so feel free to check those out um, as well as the rest of our preservation conversations on those formats. If you do not want to have your face seen on the video, feel free to have your um, screen turned off. And as a courtesy to our guest speakers today, please ensure that you are muted during their presentations. Um, so without further ado, I want to uh, give Scott and Maggie their full opportunity. Um, so please go ahead and take it away. Okay, um, thank you for that introduction, Ken. Um, I'm really glad everybody could be here. I hope that, um, I hope that, uh, first of all, I can get to the first slide of my presentation rather than the last slide of my presentation. Um, I'm pretty good at keeping uh, keeping tabs on the chat. And so if you want to um, issue any corrections in the chat, if you want to ask any questions, if you want to heckle, um, if you want to... Uh, uh, you know, uh, share some of your experiences uh, with these sites in the chat, um, feel free. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say uh, that, um, hang on, I'm just looking for one setting here um, on my screen share, but let's do it this way. Um, you know, first of all, I wanted to say I was really excited when Ken reached out because a big part of the motivation of creating an innovation trail um, is about preservation and thinking about the physical places um, that help tell these stories um, of what an incredible um, fountain of innovation Boston and Cambridge have been over several centuries. Um, I think the coolest part of this uh, hour that we're going to spend together is probably Maggie walking you around one of those places, um, which is now occupied by her organization, Lab Central. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but my main ask to you is like, I would love to have some questions, some engagement, some ideas about spreading the word. This is really a project that just got started in August 2021. We got together at Lab Central. We walked around the Kendall Square neighborhood. We talked about this idea of um, how might we create a, a tourist experience of all the great um, STEM-related innovations, past, present, and future. We had some drinks at Cambridge Brewing Company. And so this is still a very young um, initiative, but we've been trying to move really quickly. Our premise really is that, you know, Boston um, as a tourist destination does a fantastic job telling stories uh, that are about the revolution. Um, and it really works. You know, that's what the Freedom Trail is. That's what the Boston Tea Party ships are um, so many other sites, the Paul Revere House in the North End, um, you know, and so you can see it on TripAdvisor that that idea of Boston, how well we tell stories about uh, the revolutionary era is just such a big part of our brand. So what we were asking um, at this initial gathering in, in 2021 was, 
how could we tell uh, the stories of innovation and several centuries of innovation just as successfully as we've told those stories um, of the revolution? And so we created this concept of an innovation trail really um, shamelessly modeled after the Freedom Trail because it works. Um, you know, creating something walkable that people can experience either in whole or in part. Uh, Boston is a walking city. We have an incredible core of tour guides who love doing walking tours. So um, the goal was to highlight some of the hidden figures and overlook stories related to STEM, business, social innovation. Uh, we just saw this past weekend talking about social innovation, um, Martin Luther King's, you know, commemorating Martin Luther King's early career, earning his PhD at Boston University, getting married to Coretta Scott King, putting that amazing monument um, to them and to his Nobel Peace Prize on the Boston Common. We would call that social innovation for sure. Um, similar to the Freedom Trail, um, this is a walkable string of sites. Um, we like to think of it as creating a 21st century brand for Boston. Um, it ties into a display that exists at Logan Airport that you may have seen in the JetBlue terminal, which is, we call it the wall of innovation. It's a big digital display and a bunch of That's kind of a gateway, we think, um, as folks are coming to Boston. My co-founder, Bob Krim, uh, helped create that display at Logan Airport. And so some of the work we're going to do is going to plug into uh, plug into that display. Um, we think. visiting the city for people interviewing for jobs or looking at colleges. Um, this is an alternative to um, learning about the revolutionary history. Um, we can talk a little bit about the Technicolor railroad car, which was unfortunately not preserved, but uh, the, the um, color film pioneers Technicolor started their company in a railroad car parked on a siding uh, behind the MIT campus uh, in the early 20th century. One big objective of this project is really inspiring future generations of innovators and entrepreneurs. Um, we think there are very few cities that have four STEM-oriented museums within walking distance. Um, if you want to name one in the chat, uh, go ahead. But I don't think New York, London, Tokyo, some of the great cities of the world um, can say they have four STEM-oriented museums. We've got the the New MIT Museum, which just moved into Kendall Square. The Broad Discovery Center just opened a public science center in their ground floor. Uh, we have the esteemed Museum of Science over on the Charles River Dam uh, and the Mass General Museum of Medical History and Innovation. We'll talk in a uh, later part of the presentation about a Verizon-owned museum that uh, exists but isn't regularly open to the public. Uh, that's on Cambridge Street, right near where the telephone was invented. Um, you know, the trail emphasizes that this has really been the most innovative city in the U.S. over four centuries. Um, nothing against Silicon Valley, but I think you only have to go back 100 or 200 years. And, you know, Silicon Valley is largely a farming uh, area where they were great at growing, you know, uh, apricots and, uh, and grapes out there. Um, the, the thread of history really goes back much farther here in Boston. Um, diversity uh, is obviously a big part of the story that we're trying to tell. Um, women, people of color, immigrants to Boston um, have been major contributors uh, to a lot of these breakthroughs. This is a picture of Margaret Hamilton, who uh, developed a lot of the software code to help get Apollo spacecraft to the moon. Um, bit of a progress report on us. So, I mentioned we formed in 2022, 2021. Last year, we launched a mobile-friendly website. People take self-guided tours. We also have a tour partner, Cambridge Historical Tours, that has started running walking tours. Um, incredibly, even been doing walking tours in December and January for private groups and school groups. I don't think of this as like an awesome season for walking tours, but people are are doing it. Um, and we've gotten some early funding from the Cambridge Tourism Council, 
uh, Meet Boston, the Downtown Boston Business Improvement District. Um, we're really open to ideas. You know, we have some plans about how to bring the trail to life through signage and projections and in-person events, but we're really open to hearing uh, hearing other ideas about how to make this um, a cool experience for people. Um, I'd love to kind of segue into um, Maggie showing us around uh, the building that Lab Central is in in just a minute. Um, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about some of the great spaces that are part of this trail that have been preserved, some that have been demolished, some that are threatened. Um, Lab Central, the building that Maggie's in, thankfully has been preserved. Um, so has the, the Bullfinch building at MGH, which in non-COVID times um, has this amazing space, the Ether Dome uh, at the top, that, that sort of copper sheathed dome at the top of the building is the original surgical theater um, at MGH, where they performed the first operation uh, under anesthesia. So that's a pretty important breakthrough that I'm always grateful for when I have to go under the knife that we have uh, anesthesia to knock people out before major surgery. Um, this is a building that unfortunately didn't get preserved um, on what had been 109 Court Street. It's kind of close to where Cambridge Street and Government Center and the JFK Federal Building are now. I think this was probably knocked down uh, in the West End, um, the sort of raising, raising of the West End and the creation of government center. But I mean, this is an incredible building that uh, both Thomas Edison and Alexander Graham Bell worked in. Uh, Graham Bell invented the telephone there. Uh, most of the early telephone equipment and switchboards was made in this building. And uh, we just didn't think to preserve it. I'd be curious. I mean, I haven't seen any documentation about debates about whether this building should have been preserved or was just kind of caught up in that wholesale uh, you know, urban renewal uh, project uh, that uh, eventually created government center. Um, interestingly, this is a this is a photo of Kendall Square and a lot of the uh, manufacturing and industrial buildings that got raised uh, when NASA was going to build a big electronics research campus in Kendall Square. Um, this is very close to, uh, and we, these stories are part of the innovation trail, you know, thinking about what would Kendall Square have been if it was a one company or one agency town with NASA employing thousands and thousands of people and taking over all of this acreage. Um, interestingly, you see on the right is the, the one building that NASA eventually built um, is now owned by the Department of Transportation, um, and it's called the Volpe uh, Center. And... Um, you know, I, I, don't, I haven't seen any debates about should we preserve this building, but it is going to come down in the next year or two as part of MIT's uh, revamping of the, the whole NASA campus um, and building lots of new buildings on this, uh, what had been planned to be a, a major NASA campus, but just got this one building. Um, the next building I'd love to touch on, and then maybe uh, I'll stop sharing in a second so that um, Maggie can fire up her cell phone and, and talk a bit about it and walk us around, um, is this building at 700 Main Street, which just has so many ties to different eras of innovation history. Um, you can see on the outside of it, there are two plaques. One is about Alexander Graham Bell using this building uh, as a site for one of the first demonstrations of long distance telephony, long distance being from downtown Boston to almost all the way to Central Square. Um, and Edwin Land also used this building as his uh, private R&D lab when he was running Polaroid. Um, so Maggie, I will turn things over to you maybe to fill in a little bit of the other blanks related to 700 Main Street and also to show us around a little bit. Oh, and just as a reminder, Maggie, you're you're muted, but maybe you're unmuted. Can on you your hear phone. me? Yep, sounds good. Great. So I'm actually going to um, turn the camera around so that you can see not just what's behind me, but instead see what's in front of me. So I'm going to do that now. Um, and I'm going to actually, whoop, covering you with my thumb. Sorry about that. I'm going to quickly go outside um, just so you can see the building itself. Um, the, the, the part that Scott was talking about is all the way down the end of the street on Main Street. So you can see the 
Um, this new space has was added on in the 70s, and uh, you can see our lab central logo here. Um, where, as uh, as Scott was saying, um, in this building originally, actually going back into the 1800s, um, Charles Davenport introduced the first center aisle train car, um, which was quite innovation innovative at the time. I hope no one's getting sick from me walking around like this. Um, but I wanna show you two displays that we have in our lobby. Um, one is an homage to the phone. Um, so one of the original telephones that was used um, by Thomas Watson making the phone call to Alexander Graham Bell in Boston. And then we also have a display for the Polaroid camera. Um, so Edwin Land's lab was here. <clears throat> and uh, you can see a, a little Polaroid image of our team when we, we first opened. Um, additionally, in this space, the Stilson wrench was invented, which a lot of people know as the pipe wrench um, used very much today. Um, but what we're gonna quickly do now is go in and see how the lab is used currently. We have felt a lot of responsibility um, for innovation here because of all of the developments that took place. So what you can see right now is the open lab space where we have um, really over 60 companies uh, in all of our buildings that are all developing um, various aspects of science. Um, so vaccine development, testing, um, ALS, Alzheimer's, uh, some of our team walking around wondering what I'm doing. Um, our sponsor wall, just gonna give you a quick view down our lab space. Um, we also host a gallery here that uh, highlights local artists. But as you can see, there are lots of folks here, lots of pieces of equipment. So lots of innovations happening uh, that we're extremely proud of and excited to be a part of um, continuing the history of this building. We are intending um, coming this year to actually move those um, sites that I showed you with the phone and um, the wrench and the camera. And we're gonna move that to a space that is right here. And I don't know if I got my slide to Scott in time to show the draft of what that's gonna look like, but we're gonna have some innovation trail signage in this location, as well as the exhibits. And then our plan is to enable people to come to this space when they're walking on the trail and they can come inside, quickly go to the bathroom if they need to. If it's the winter, they can get a cup of hot chocolate and uh, see what's happening now and what was happening many years ago. So that's about it. I'll leave it back to you, Scott. All right, I love it. That was such a fast paced tour. And I have to point out that one of the things when I'm walking groups around to talk about the innovation trail, I, I keep it on my wall when uh, when I'm not out and about is a Stilson wrench. So awesome. the story Maggie was alluding to is that not just was this building used to make or the site used to make railroad cars uh, in the early days of rail transportation. Um, but at one point, uh, it was part of the Walworth Manufacturing Company, which made a lot of uh, what furnace and steam boiler equipment. Um, and one of their engineers came up with the idea of, wouldn't it be cool if you had a wrench with these teeth, this dial, um, the ability to kind of adjust the size of the wrench and get a really good purchase on whatever pipe you needed to adjust. Um, so uh, Maggie, I might donate this to the display uh, if you need a good old Walworth. I, I got this one. You can still buy these at at hardware stores, but this one is uh, definitely like a late 19th century one that says that it was made, uh, you know, made in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Which I'm actually, cool. I'm actually bidding for one just like that on <laughs> eBay right now, because I'm trying to find one that says Cambridge on it and says Stilson runs. Those are a little harder to find. So yeah, if I don't win. I may have to come take yours. All right, cool. Well, it could be on loan. Um, <laughs> Awesome. So let me just share a couple more slides and then I would love to hear questions, hear reactions um, from this group. So, uh, you know, Maggie talked about this is the outside of the building. Um, the one thing we couldn't see when she was walking around is that um, many of the windows on this building have kind of a hidden feature, 
which is they actually took steel rails from railroad tracks um, and built them into the window uh, lintels of this building, um, which I think is a really cool touch and just a reference to um, the heritage of Cambridge. We never think of Cambridge as like a railroad innovator, but uh, they were making really modern railroad cars on that site. Um, the last couple of sites I'll talk about, um, Out of Town News, I think is still in the midst of being um, rethought and revamped by the city of Cambridge, uh, now that it's not an active newsstand. But obviously, this is a pretty important spot for us um, to mention. Um, it's the place where uh, Paul Allen, who's the bearded guy on the left in the photo, bought a copy of uh, Popular Electronics in 1975. And went back uh, to his friend Bill Gates's dorm room and said, you know, this computer thing seems to be taking off. I think we should start a company. Um, and so that was really the genesis of Microsoft after buying uh, a magazine at Out of Town News in Harvard Square. Um, this is one of my favorite spots on the trail. It's just down the street from Maggie um, on Main Street. Um, and it's the Cambridge Brands Factory, the last still operating candy factory in Cambridge. Um, so for us on the trail, this lets us do two things. You know, we can tie into Cambridge as a center of candy manufacturing, um, which it once was in the 20th century. I think there were 50 plus uh, manufacturers of different kinds of candy in Cambridge, which people can really relate to. Um, and talk about manufacturing as really um, the central activity in much of the 1800s and 1900s in the Central Square, Kendall Square neighborhood. Um, and talk today about people manufacturing largely uh, new drugs and new therapeutics. You can see in the back of this picture is the big Novartis uh, research lab, which now occupies what had been the NECO, um, the NECO building. And uh, if you've walked around that area, you probably noticed the water tower, water tank at the top of the building used to be painted like a roll of NECO wafers in those pastel colors. Um, and these days, Novartis decided to put a DNA helix um, on the on the outside. Uh, I can also, so, Scott, I can add, yeah. also quickly add that one of the benefits of, of this area of the tour is that you get the wafts of chocolate and caramel cooking throughout the day. So it's it's more of a scratch and sniff. It's it's really wonderful if you work in this location. <laughs> it's true. And I mean, there's so much cool stuff to discover. I mean, first of all, I didn't know until I wrote a piece about Cambridge Brands, this factory, that they make every junior mint in the world is produced in this factory. And then one day I was walking the, by the back of the factory after, after having dinner, um, I think at the uh, Naco Taco over there on Mass Ave. And I saw there are basically ports in the back of this building that, that the trucks pull up and they basically like pour chocolate and liquid sugar um, into the building with a fire hose like attachment, uh, which is really amazing. Um, so just in the home stretch here, um, Verizon has a, a museum of telephony that unfortunately is not open to the public regularly. We've convinced them to open it to a few of our special tours. But part of what we're trying to do with the trail, as I mentioned, is to make sure we're preserving um, buildings that are important um, and potentially also to help some of these companies think about, as Maggie was just saying, you know, how do you elevate the profile of these important breakthroughs? How do you tell the story? Um, there's thousands of people a day that walk by this Verizon building uh, near Bowdoin Square on Cambridge Street. Uh, if you were walking from Government Center to MGH, you would pass this building and they have no plaques, nothing in the windows, no open to the public hours. And yet it's got this fantastic collection of antique telephones, um, I'm curious, put in the chat, if you've ever been inside this building, I'd be curious to hear that. Um, the real um, prize possession is that they have a recreation of Alexander Graham Bell's lab bench um, that once existed in downtown Boston. Um, and the recreation was overseen while Thomas Watson was still alive. So, you know, he ensured that this is what it actually looked like when we were developing the telephone in the 1870s. Um, last couple of slides, just our, our social handles here on this slide. Um, we have a TripAdvisor page, and we've been starting to collect reviews from people who've been on some of the guided tours, and it's off to a good start. We've got the coveted five circles on TripAdvisor. Um, and so with that, 
I would love to kind of wrap up the slidey part of our hour today and the mobile phone tour part of our hour today. Um, and maybe hear some questions from you. Um, questions from Joe, um, ideas for us. Um, as I mentioned, this is a pretty young project and our big goal for 2023 is just to build awareness and get more people uh, participating, run more walking tours and get more people participating in those tours, largely in the nice weather months between May and, and November. Scott, Maggie, thank you so much for that overview of this incredible new opportunity here in Boston and Cambridge. Um, if you haven't had an opportunity yet to check out their website, we can put a link to that um, in our chat here. Um, or if you haven't had a chance to, to explore some of these sites, I really do encourage you to. Um, there's some really interesting hidden histories there that you know I, I certainly wasn't aware of. And it was, it was a lot of fun to watch some of the videos and, and read through some of, the, some of the great research that you guys have available. Um, as Scott said, we can now open it up to some questions. So whether you'd like to put your questions in the chat or uh, raise your hand in the little icon, we'll be happy to go through those. Um, just to get us started, um, Scott and Maggie, one of the questions that I had when I was preparing uh, for this presentation is I was, I was curious to know, you know, your, your guys' process into what was the process in choosing which sites made it onto the trail? I mean, was it a difficult decision? Did you have to leave a lot out? How did you determine those original 21 or 22 stops that went on the trail? Well, I'll start and maybe Maggie can chime in on the process. I mean, we felt like it had to be a finite number of stops because that works for the Freedom Trail. You know, like while nobody really walks the whole Freedom Trail, it's at least conceptual like, oh, I could start in the morning at Park Street and end at the Bunker Hill Monument um, if I really wanted to drag my family or my guests along for all those miles. You can wrap your arm around, your, your mind around it. And I think we just said, we can't have this be a hundred or 500 places where cool things were invented. You could probably do 250 places just on the MIT campus, you know, um, and, and just have it be the MIT innovation trail. Um, but like, we were looking for stuff that was visible where you could see a building where something happened, where you could at least stop and see a plaque and kind of try to imagine the context. And the best stuff of all is stuff, you know, that people can go in and spend an hour at, you know, like this new Broad Discovery Center, like the MIT Museum, which is fabulous, um, like the MGH Museum, which frankly, I had not been into before we started this project, but, you know, is a really nice small museum, like 45 minutes, you've seen it, most of it and read all the plaques. Um, I don't know, Maggie, if you remember, like, if there were other debates or discussions about what should be on the trail. Yeah, I think the biggest challenge that, that we had was, um, keeping the scope limited. Um, there were, you know, a lot of a lot of conversations and I, I remember my suggestion, you know, wanting to expand it to, to other things that had been innovated um, in and around the area. And there we just were uncovering so many that mm -hmm. we had to keep it limited in order to just get something off the ground and then hope that we have the ability to expand it later. Yeah, there's, a, there's an area of the website where we put a whole bunch of stuff that's off the trail. I mean, Lowell Mills is an important, the Lowell National Historic Site is an important place, the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation, but a lot of that stuff is just not walkable. And so we didn't want to confuse people about, do I need a car? Is this a bus tour? Like the core trail really is walkable. Um, Maggie, Stacey asked the question, are sites listed on the National Register? Is your building on the National Register or no? It's just, uh, it's got some uh, You know, that's a good question. I don't know if it's on the National Register. Um, it's for Massachusetts, but I'm not sure about National. I'm going to actually look into that, making me curious. I think most are probably not, you know. I mean, historic places, this audience would know about that process much more than I would, but it tends to not be very, it, that process tends not to attract a lot of business and technology sites, entrepreneurial oriented sites. I mean, I'd be curious even if like, does the mill, is the mill at Maynard a uh, National Register historic site, you know, both as a textile mill and as the former headquarters of digital equipment? I'm not sure. Um, on the, how do people learn about your tours? Um, the website has a link. Um, 
what what is sort of happening in the off season is that there are school groups and family groups and corporate groups that are booking tours um, with our tour partner, Cambridge Historical Tours, just on a whatever date they want to do. If Cambridge Historical Tours has a guide, they'll make it happen. Um, and then over the course of the summer, our plan is to get into a more regular, you know, having one or two or three tours a week that you would just kind of be able to buy a single ticket for. Um, the group tour price is not um, not that expensive right now. You know, it's in the 200 to $250 range. So, you know, if you've got 10 people along with you, that's a pretty wow. typical um, per head tour price. Let's see, uh, Amy says, I've never heard of that museum until now. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I have talked to a lot of Verizon employees who, when you tell them that museum exists, even they have trouble figuring out how to get access to it. Um, it's definitely not a priority for Verizon, unfortunately, but we're kind of looking at this you know, we're looking at this project as a way to sort of show some examples of what people can do. You know, if you're Lab Central setting up a display on the wall that's part of the lobby that visitors can see and maybe learn about what is the innovation trail. Um, or the best case scenario is, is you know, um, having something that people can go into and, and interact with and touch and engage with. One of the things I really, really like about um, some of the sites and the histories that you're interested in telling here, um, there's really a good, a good variety of things. It, it doesn't stick to one, I should say, you know, theme. There's a little bit of African American history. There's a little bit of social history. There's obviously a lot of technological and science and medical history. Um, were there things as you researched these sites um, that surprised you that you weren't aware of until you really started digging into them? What were some of the epiphanies you had during the process? Maggie, which of these things surprised you? Because you you're um, you know you live in this world of life sciences um, discovery on a daily basis. Like, was any of this stuff new to you when you started working on this project with us? I think a lot of it was new to me because I am sort of more in the life science area, and it was fun finding out. Um, I know just when we moved into this building, we were thrilled when we found out about the wrench and the train car and the, the camera. Um, those were all things that were, were new to all of us. And I think as, as more stuff gets uncovered, um, I think there's one of the things was the, the biscuit company that's here in Cambridge um, that I found out that I walked by that every day um, and had no idea that that's where the majority of the, the biscuits and fig newtons were coming from. Um, so there are lots of things like that that are always really surprising. Oh, yeah, that's funny that even people in Massachusetts will tell you, oh, the fig Newton was invented in Newton, clearly. But no, it was invented by this uh, Kennedy Baking Company. Yeah. Is that the name of it? Yeah. In Cambridge, it was named for Newton, sure. But yeah. uh, invented and made in Cambridge. Um, trying to think about some of the, uh, you know, I, I think one of the things that I discovered a while ago doing some writing and research is like nobody associates Thomas Edison with Boston. You know, he has such a strong association to either Menlo Park, where his labs were in New Jersey, or to Florida, um, you know, where his uh, his winter house was. He and he and Henry Ford kind of lived next to each other, and it's a really great um, visitor's uh, National Historic Site um, down in, uh, oh, someone's going to remember the name of this awesome town on the west coast of Florida, um, and I was just there a year or two ago. <laughs> <laughs> but this will be this will be interactive. If you've been there, put it in the chat. Um, so nobody associates Edison with Boston, but he started his career here. You know, he was a he was a rock star telegraph operator, and so he came to Boston because this was a center of telegraph action, um, and started his career as an inventor. And kind of had his first painful experience in Boston, where um, his first patented invention was a vote recording, an automatic vote recording. Um, machine that he intended to sell to state legislatures and sell to Congress. Um, but what he discovered after he started to demonstrate it to elected officials was they didn't want the process of voting um, to be faster because it gave them less time to go over and you know try to buttonhole and convince their fellow legislators to change their mind. 
And so, you know, that invention of Edison's never took off. Um, it was never produced. Um, and it really persuaded Edison. He learned this lesson while working in Boston. Like there's a great quote where he said, you know, I learned never again to invent anything for which there wasn't, uh, you know, a clear and obvious market need, um, which is something that entrepreneurs are still learning in the, in the 21st century. Yeah, it's incredible. The types of stories that you just uncover like that. You never, as you say, you never associate these famous people with these sites. And yet that history is still there. All you need to do is you do a little digging, do a little research, and you'll find it. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, a, a big part of like the foundation that we're trying to build is, you know, how do you tell these stories in really engaging ways, like for students, um, you know, for visitors to Boston? A lot of what is on the trail today is kind of you are looking at the plaque, you know, that is actually quite hard to find that, um, you know, indicates where this building was that Edison and Graham Bell worked in, or you're looking at a building where something happened. And so we're definitely thinking about whether it's projections or whether it's augmented reality, or we're working on an audio tour right now, like how do you make this an experience that feels like, okay, I'm, I'm really being told a, you know, a captivating and compelling story as I do this, rather than like going through a list of places and, and you know, uh, maybe snapping a picture at each of them. I, I can share a, a little story that we found out as we were researching more about our building. <clears throat> we found out that, um, Edwin Land uh, actually was very well known for taking naps under his desk because he would get tired. And so he would just crawl under his desk and take naps. And he was quite famous for that. And so um, ironically, when we were developing our space, we actually have nap rooms because scientists are here working 24 hours, seven days a week. And so we have nap rooms where they can go in and take naps. And we decided to locate one of them in the same location as where his office was in the building as a little homage to, to him uh, starting the trend of naps long, long time ago. Um, so it's been really neat finding out those, those little quirky things. Yeah, I love that. I had, I had not heard that story. Um, it's really cool. I, I think that, um, you know, the uh, the other kind of fun, um, well, I think one thing preservation wise to talk about, which I, I'm curious if if folks have thought about or debated is, you know, you know, stuff built in the 20th century in the second half of the 20th century um, in Boston is very hard. It seems like it's very hard to get the momentum of, you know, preservation rolling around that. And so we do have this this Volpe building, which was built for NASA in Kendall Square. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you'd call it kind of, um, you know, GSA standard architecture for the 1960s. Um, and MIT, you know, has decided, I think, working with probably the um, Cambridge Redevelopment Authority that that building is going to come down. And they've already built a beautiful new building for the Department of Transportation over on Binney Street. But you know, it's just interesting to for us to think about that zone of, you know, really the whole 20th century in Boston is considered really young. Um, and so, you know, one of our concerns is like, hey, if, um, if uh, Novartis had not decided to occupy the Necco factory, or if at some point Cambridge brand slash Tootsie Roll decides to stop making candy in that factory, um, in Central Square, um, would we be able to preserve those things or would it, you know, would it just uh, get demolished and, you know, you'd have a plaque that said, you know, this was where the Necco factory was. Um, you know, luckily Novartis decided to take over the Necco complex um, and has really renovated and it's a beautiful, really modern building. Um, I think some of the other candy factories in Cambridge have been turned into condos and they keep you know, some of the signage up, you can still see like the squirrel nut brands um, painted sign on a condo building um, in Cambridge. But, you know, it's just, an, it's an interesting zone of history, the the, the 20th century, um, you know, places that would be considered historic in many other cities are just not old enough for Boston to, to view them as historic. 
Well, and those conversations always continue to evolve. And as we start looking towards that history, as dare I say, history, not just, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you know, we start do we do start thinking about those as important um, historic sites as well. Um, so I, I look forward to those continued conversations. Does anybody else have any questions for Scott and Maggie? Okay, seeing none, I do have one last question I guess we could wrap up on for the two of you. Now, as we know, and I think Scott, as you alluded to at the beginning of your presentation, Boston um, has a reputation for being known for a particular sort of history, the revolutionary history, the founding fathers, you know. Um, and of course, as we know, we're gearing up to celebrate the or commemorate the 250th anniversary of the revolution here within the next couple of years. So my question to you um, and Maggie is, why is it important now, especially to tell these stories, to preserve this history? You know, why, why should it matter for, quote unquote, the average Joe who visits Boston on a daily basis? It's really a really great question. I mean, uh, we're definitely aware of the um, of the upcoming 250th. Um, I, I view this really as something that ties into that history. Like it doesn't need to compete with it, right? The revolution and, um, you know, the creation of the United States kind of created this awesome foundation, right? A patent system, um, a free market economy that lets you do all this um, innovation. And it's so interesting to me, the ties, you know, the innovation trail, if you start it in Boston versus starting in Cambridge, you're starting it right across from the old South meeting house where the Boston tea party, uh, took place. And you're really, you know, it overlaps a little bit with some freedom trail sites because we do talk about, you know, the first public school in the U S, um, Boston Latin. Um, and, you know, I think revolution and that access to, public education, uh, the creation of Harvard University, Harvard College initially, um, are some of the foundational things that I think led to all this science and technology and entrepreneurship. Um, and there are some interesting, you know, ways to, to tie the innovation trail into the revolution, um, you know, in that, uh, you know, the, the surgeon who was basically the chief surgeon at Mass General uh, was part of the Warren family, um, John Collins Warren, uh, you know, who, whose father and uncle were, you know, were key players um, in uh, in the early many of the early revolutionary uh, battles. Um, and so, yeah, I think I, I think we don't want to position this as something that is in any way competing with the Freedom Trail or revolutionary history, but as kind of, hey, if you're interested in what happened after. Uh, you know, the 1770s in Boston, you know, this is kind of about those next couple hundred years and also what what happens now, you know, some of the present um, breakthroughs and research that are being done. So like, we don't want to be seen as totally all history, you know, this is kind of past, present and looking into the future. Very well said, Scott. And that's after all what it's all about. It's not just about the past, it's about the present. And it's about what we could do as a, as a community, as a city, as a nation moving forward. Um, and we're so excited to see um, you guys, how you progress um, and, and some of the more exciting programs that, and events you guys have coming up in the next couple of years. Folks, if you have a chance, please, please support the Innovation Trail um, and uh, visit their website, follow them on social media. We look forward to see what comes um, from the next so thank you to Maggie and Scott for joining us on this hour. We really appreciated you guys uh, having a chance to give us a rundown on the innovation trail. Um, and thank you to everyone who continues to support our programming um, on a monthly or weekly basis. Um, so we will go ahead and end this reservation conversation. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. All right. Hey, thanks, Joe, for the opportunity. Good to see you, Maggie. Thanks, everyone.